Although now largely unknown outside of Canadian history and literary circles, Agnes Ethelwyn Wetherald was a prominent Canadian journalist and poet of the 19th and early 20th century. Born in Rockwood, Ontario on April 26, 1857, Ethelwyn Wetherald was the sixth of eleven children of Quaker parents Jemima Harris Balls and William Wetherald. William was an educator and later a Quaker minister who founded Rockwood Academy, a private school, in 1850. Some of Ethelwyn's earliest memories were all-day excursions with her siblings, picking wild raspberries among the hills of Rockwood. Thinking about the name and Rockwood's idyllic scenery, she later reminisced, hills and rocks, woods and the smell of cedars, all come back in the name. While Ethelwyn was enjoying her early childhood, her father William was working to build the number of students at the academy, an effort that met with great success. The school operated from 1850 to 1883 and was known for providing a top-notch education, attracting students of modest means due to its low fees, as well as the wealthy who were sent because of its prestige. An impressive three-story stone building, built in 1853 to replace an original log structure, is still standing. Alumni of the school included James Hill, builder of the Great Northern Railway, who was taught by William Wetherald, and Sir Adam Beck, advocate of publicly owned electricity and first chairman of the Hydroelectric Power Commission. William Wetherald taught at Rockwood for several years before he took up a position as superintendent of Haverford College near Philadelphia in 1864. While living there, eight-year-old Ethelwyn and her family were present for a historic and tragic moment of American history. On April 22, 1865, they stood as the funeral train carrying the remains of Abraham Lincoln and his young son Willie slowly passed through Haverford Township on its journey from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois for burial. Ethelwyn recalled, I watched the slow-moving train draped in black passing by the railroad station, bearing the dead body of President Lincoln. The aura of intense grief nationwide and the sorrowful face of my father made a deep impression. Much later in life, she wrote a poem about the impact of Lincoln's death titled The Voice of Lincoln. A fascination and engagement with the mysteries of life and death were evident in both Ethelwyn's readings and her own poetry. She remembered that while visiting friends in New York at the age of 19, she attended a Unitarian church meeting in which Dr. Henry Whitney Bellows, a famous orator, preacher, and founder of the U.S. Sanitary Commission during the Civil War, was speaking. Rather than being interested in Bellows' words from the pulpit, she was more impressed by the fact that she was seated just one row behind prominent writer William Cullen Bryant, whose poem Thanatopsis, written circa 1811 to 1816 and translated as A Consideration of Death, likely provided some inspiration for her own poems, such as one titled The Wind of Death. William Wetherill's love of education and teaching meant Ethelwyn and her siblings were provided with a thorough education too first at home by William himself, and then, in Ethelwyn's case, at the Friends Boarding School in Union Springs, New York, and later at Pickering College in Newmarket, Ontario. Just a few years into their time in Haverford, Pennsylvania, likely sometime in 1866, the family moved back to Ontario, this time to Fenwick, now part of Pelham, Ontario, and a picturesque part of the Niagara region. Their new home was an idyllic fruit and dairy farm, eventually named Tall Evergreens, where Ethelwyn would spend many of the years of her life. The name of the Wetherald homestead stemmed from spruce and pine trees planted by her father William and brother Sam in 1867. When friends visiting Fenwick for the first time arrived at the station and asked for directions to the Wetherald homestead, they would be told, take the next road south and go east a mile till you come to some tall evergreens. That's the place. The name stuck, and the setting inspired nature themes and much of Ethelwyn's writing throughout her life. The reading of all kinds of literature was encouraged in the Wetherald household, and Ethelwyn remembered later in life about how she was strongly influenced at a young age by men and women writers of past eras. Her list of favorites was a veritable who's who of North American and European writers of the past several centuries. Jane Austen, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thomas Carlyle, Mary Wilkins, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and George Eliot. She recalled that she had finished all of Charles Dickens' many novels by the time she was 15 years old, and all of Shakespeare's massive body of plays and other writings before she was 20. 
like many writers then and now, Weatherald found she took naturally to writing, unlike mathematics and other subjects. She recalled the, quote, endless patience of a favorite teacher at Pickering College who tutored her in math even during some evenings, often with no effect. When it came to numbers, Weatherald was, in her own words, hopeless. Weatherald's voracious reading and writing paid off at a young age. At just 17, she sent what she called a string of stanzas to St. Nicholas Magazine, a popular American children's magazine. The subject of her poetry was the antics of her brothers Lewis and Herbert, aged four and two. She later said of the poem, It was a mere rhyme, so I don't regret its oblivion. Though Ethelwyn's later career would be characterized by her poetry, beginning in the late 1880s she made her mark as a journalist and guest contributor. At that time she made contributions to the Toronto Globe under the nom de plume Belle Thistlethwaite, a contraction of the maiden name of her paternal grandmother. She was also made women's editor of the paper. Throughout the 1880s to late 1890s, she contributed to a plethora of newspapers and magazines, including Scribner's, the Detroit Free Press, the Chicago Current, The Week, the Canadian Monthly and National Review, Toronto Saturday Night, and many more. Her literary range was vast, with articles on everything from travel to the qualities of a poet, and even a ghost story written in 1881 for Rose Belford's Canadian Monthly and National Review. The short story had everything of the classic ghost tale in it, including a stormy night and the protagonist recounting a tragic death from the past. The 1880s were productive years, but also a time when Ethelwyn drew criticism. In 1887, she produced her only novel, co-authored with Graham Mercer Adam. Titled An Algonquin Maiden, a romance of the early days of Upper Canada, the novel was heavily criticized for a romanticized, unrealistic view of Indigenous life. One of her critics was Indigenous poet and author Emily Pauline Johnson. Embarrassed by the novel and the criticism she received, for the rest of her life Weatherald attempted to distance herself from it. It was around that time, just before her move to London, Ontario, that she submitted her poem, The Wind of Death, to a publication called Traveler's Record. The poem, which has the themes of nature, love, and the inevitability of death, is a beautiful and poignant piece that became one of my favorites after reading it. The last stanza reads, A wind of death that darkly blows, each separate ship of human woes. Far out on a mysterious sea, I turn, I turn my face to thee. Even many years later in 1931, Ethelwyn remembered receiving a $10 check for the poem and the boarders she lived with at the time being astonished that someone could make, quote, real money for a string of verses. In 1890, she moved to London, Ontario, where she worked as the assistant editor of a short-lived feminist magazine titled Wives and Daughters. Although many of her views would be considered outdated or offensive today, Weatherill's interest in women's issues such as suffrage and constricting an unhealthy fashion lasted throughout her lifetime and were progressive for their time. Several surviving clippings at the Brock University archives from her contributions to Women's World make this clear. In one short piece on women's suffrage from 1888, she praised traditional womanhood and the place of a woman in the home, but stated that as women's education had progressed in the 19th century, a woman, quote, desires the right to vote, not be it understood as a privilege, but as a right, end quote. Concluding her piece, she stated that, quote, Men have no more right to be sole legislators for women and men than women would have to be sole legislators for men and women. In another 1888 piece from Women's World, Ethelwyn spoke of the problem of making even young girls wear constricting, tightly laced corsets designed in theory to shape their bodies in a more perceived feminine way, but conducive to a range of potential health problems including difficulty breathing, coughing, and deformity. She wrote of classmates during her school years often loosening their clothes in the evening before studying. She affirmed, quote, When respiration, digestion, and circulation are impeded, the brain cannot do its best work. End quote. Ethelwyn's stay in London was short lived, only approximately three years, but she retained fond memories of her time there. Later in life, she recalled taking lessons in side saddle horseback riding, by then, she said, already the old fashioned way for women to ride. Reflecting on how automobiles had changed the world since those days, she stated that, quote, My friends and I often went for a 20-mile ride in the moonlight. No mere motor car could give such pleasure as that. 
After returning to the family home in Fenwick in 1893, Wetherald began a very productive phase of writing that culminated in her first book of verse, titled The House of the Trees and Other Poems, published in 1895. This well-received collection made her name among Canadian women writers and poets. The duality of nature's restorative and destructive power, its vastness and humanity's interconnectedness with it, as well as feelings of the sublime, are consistent themes throughout the collection. In the titular poem of the collection, Wetherald wrote, Ope your doors and take me in, spirit of the wood. Wash me clean of dust and din, clothe me in your mood. Take me from the noisy light to the sunless peace, where at midday standeth night, signing toil's release. Wetherald's Quaker upbringing and steadfast hope and faith in God also played a role in her poetry, as in another poem from the House of the Trees titled The Prayer of the Year. It reads, Leave me hope when I am old, strip my joys from me, let November to the cold bear each leafy tree, chill my lover, dull my friends, only while I grope, to the dark, the silent end, leave me hope. After a short stint in Philadelphia during the winter of 1895-96 to as literary editor of the Ladies' Home Journal, Wetherald returned to the family home, Tall Evergreens. She spent most of the rest of her life there, and her prolific writing continued unabated. The next few decades would see her recognition as a poet reach into the highest levels of Canadian literary society and earn her praise from many prominent figures. In 1902, she published a second collection of verses titled Tangled in Stars, and in 1904, a third called The Radiant Road. In late 1907, she published her best and most famous collection, The Last Robin, Lyrics and Sonnets. After its publication, she received a letter from Earl Grey, who was then Governor General of Canada. Clara Kirchhofer, wife of Manitoba Senator John Nesbitt Kirchhofer, had gifted Grey a copy of the book for Christmas. Grey wrote to Wetherald, I cannot resist giving myself the pleasure of congratulating you and Canada also on The Last Robin. I am deeply grateful to Mrs. Kirchhofer for having illumined my Christmas table with its April gleam, and for thus making me acquainted with your verses. I have read them all, lyrics and sonnets. The Governor General also purchased 25 copies to give to friends. Clara Kirchhofer also gave a copy to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who in 1911 even quoted from the book in the House of Commons when speaking about the Reciprocity Treaty with the United States. Praise was also forthcoming from newspapers. The Globe in Toronto said, The salient quality of Miss Wetherald's work is its freshness of feeling, a perennial freshness, renewable as spring. This has a setting of harmonious form, for the poet's ear is delicately attuned to the value of words, both as to the sound and the meaning. Wetherald was now considered one of the greatest Canadian poets. Another major event happened in Ethelwyn's life around that time. Between 1911 and 1912, she decided to adopt a daughter, Dorothy. Photos from 1912 to the 1930s show them enjoying a seemingly tranquil life at Tall Evergreens. A treehouse built in 1910 on a willow tree provided amusement, nice views of the homestead, and even was occasionally a fun place to sleep at night. Sadly, in 1920 it was blown down during gale force winds. Wetherald recalled, The old willow, being very much alive and steadily growing, seemed to work itself loose from the house fastened to its branches. The last nights I slept in it were memorable. Every joint and ligament shrieked and groaned in the wind. So finally, when the dear thing was pulled away by the gale and fell to the ground, roof downward, I saw the finis had been written. Wetherald kept up her writing, now inspired by motherhood and experiences with her daughter. In 1921, she published another book of verse for young readers called Treetop Mornings, dedicated to Dorothy. The touching page reads, One bright morning a year ago, when I said goodbye in a run along now as I am very busy tone of voice, you turned to me with tears, exclaiming, When you send me off to school without one happy word, it makes my feelings feel bad. And so, my Dorothy, my little heart, I am inscribing all these happy words to you in the hope that they will make your feelings feel good. Wetherald continued writing even into her later years, while also enjoying leisurely times at tall evergreens with Dorothy, other family members, and friends. She never gave up writing, and even in 1939, a year before her death, she composed a poem in her diary titled Sympathy. Despite her seemingly ceaseless energy, 
time finally caught up with Ethelwyn. On March 10, 1940, she passed away at home from pneumonia, just shy of 83 years old. She was laid to rest two days later, on March 12th, at the Pelham Evangelical Friends Church Cemetery. Her name was inscribed just below that of her brother Herbert, and a plaque was added with her poem, Legacies, on it. A beautiful piece of verse which combined some of her classic themes of nature, God, and existence. Unto my friends I give my thoughts, unto my God my soul. Unto my foe I leave my love, these are of life the whole. Nay, there is something, a trifle, left. Who shall receive this dower? See, earth mother, a handful of dust, turn it into a flower. There is simply too much to say about Ethelwyn's life to pack into one short video, or that of her father William, a pioneer in education, or of her daughter Dorothy, who became one of Canada's most experienced women pilots, received an Order of Canada in 2003, and became the first woman to serve on the Pelham Town Council in the 1960s. Those are tales for other times. But suffice it to say, Ethelwyn's legacy includes being one of Canada's pioneer women journalists, as well as one of its most accomplished and respected poets. I own a copy of her book, The House of the Trees, and it includes some of my favourite poetry from any place and any time. Although somewhat unknown outside of historical and literary circles, the rise of interest in women's histories and the ability to find her now out-of-copyright works on the internet has led to a resurgence of interest in Ethelwyn's life and works. In Niagara, my home region, we are blessed to have the Ethelwyn Weather Enfant at the Brock University Archives. One of my favourite objects is this copy of Ethelwyn's poem, Red Cedar, that's actually inscribed into a piece of red cedar wood. Most of the images you've seen in this video come from that collection. I spoke with David Sharon, Brock University archivist, who knows firsthand about the collection's importance and Weatherald's legacy. Ethelwyn's records chronicle the life of an extraordinary individual. Independent-minded, talented, and creative, Ethelwyn worked in the male-dominated newspaper field as a columnist, wrote poetry that appeared in magazines and school books, and was read by the Prime Minister and Governor General of Canada, and she was a wonderful single mother who raised another great Canadian, Dorothy Rungeling. Ethelwyn was truly a woman ahead of her time. Her records continue to inspire students, faculty, and beyond to this day. Those interested in learning more about her life can find some of the collection online, and here I must make a special thanks to David Sharon and the Brock University Archives for their permission to use many of the images seen in this video. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and tell your friends. Thanks very much for watching.